And so now I say it's my honor to present the Reverend Dr. David Capes. Currently, he is the interim dean of the Honors College at Houston Baptist University. He earned both his Master of Divinity and PhD in New Testament from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. So credit to Father Nesty and to the spirit of Monsignor Steele that tonight we have a professor from the Baptist University speaking at a Catholic seminary on the Gospel of St. Paul. Thank God for this opportunity, right? Amen. And I would like to echo Father Nesty's words that uh, as Catholics, we do want to extend a welcome to our Baptist brothers and sisters and anyone from any other denomination. Hopefully you feel at home. Hopefully you feel welcome and we enjoy the conversation and dialogue that we can have today. Now, as many of you already know about Reverend David Capes, he's a radio star. Uh, you may know if you listen to the show, he wanted to be a rock star, a music star, but instead he's a radio star. And I'm going to put a plug in for our show. It's a weekly radio show on Sunday evenings from 7 to 9 p.m. on KPRC 950 a.m. And it's called A Show of Faith. As Rabbi Stuart Federo, the Reverend David Capes, and usually as Father Mario Arroyo from St. Cyril's, Father Bill's successor, and occasionally myself. And it's a tremendous show where you can hear a dialogue from a rabbi, a minister, and a priest about different current events. If you have listened to the show, and you probably have come to know Reverend David Capes. And a few things I would like to emphasize today as I introduce him to give our lecture here at St. Mary's Seminary. David has a passion for the radicalness of the message of Jesus Christ. He finds in Paul's letters a call to a complete transformation of heart, one in which words match actions. David promotes really focusing on Christ at Christmas, maybe buying a sweater for a poor child instead of a sweater for a friend. He calls Christians to help develop safe drinking water in Angola so that men and women who do not have safety and even drinking can have the basic essentials of life. David is passionate that the message of Jesus Christ calls to a complete transformation of heart. He publishes copiously. Recently, he published in union with another minister from his church, Chris Say, a translation to the New Testament called The Voice. Now, as someone who has become his friend, I trust his scholarship. I trust his knowledge of the Greek and the intention of the author. And as an American who reads it in current culture, I find it a language that can resonate and speak to me. He desires to preach to contemporary culture so that others may know the radicalness of the message of Christ. How good it is this evening that here in the seminary we have Reverend Dr. David Capes, the, Amer the Dean of the Honors College of Houston Baptist University. Thank you. How do you follow Brendan Cahill? I'm not sure. How, does, how do you do that? Well, thank you, Father. It's been such a delight to get to know him on the radio show. Every, you know, when we started talking about this, a priest, a minister, and a rabbi walked into a radio station. It sounds like a joke, you know? <laughs> but it's really not. It's, we've been, in fact, we've been on the air five years this coming Sunday on this station, and we were on the air for a year and a half 
before on uh, a station called 97 Talk, Houston's only FM talk station. That was back a few years ago. But it's been a great project for me and Father Nesty's been on the show. The Cardinal, when he was the Archbishop, was on the show. Uh, John's going to be on the show soon, I hope, and, and uh, you'll continue. And, uh, and Father Mario is just doing a great job. Thank you so much for those kind words. I, I sound pretty good in introduction. I'm, I, hope, I hope I can uh, match up to what I'm hearing this evening. Um, it is a real privilege for me to be here with you, this, this Baptist who, uh, I, I think if it's okay with you, I'm one of the most Catholic Baptists you'll ever meet. <laughs> if, it's, uh, if that's okay to use those words, it's not an oxymoron because I really do believe in one holy apostolic Catholic church. I really do. And, and, and I do believe that unity is what God is in the heart of God. And I think we're moving and we're seeing and we, and we, we sense that. And, and I want to be a part of those conversations. I want to be a catalyst for making that so. And so I'm grateful for an opportunity to share. Father Nesty, thank you for this opportunity. And Jan uh, has just been excellent in working with us. I know of no more important or more strategic uh, movement now of the church than what we're seeing happening with the faith and culture center here. Uh, I hope you will support it. I hope you will continue to be a part of its future endeavors uh, because the intersection of faith and culture is crucial. Uh, I've read reports recently that some are saying that, well, you know, we're losing a bit, bit of ground. Some are saying evangelicals are moving, losing ground. The Catholics, mainstream denominations are losing ground. And, and, and I want to be a part of those that encounter culture, engage culture in a way t so that we can uh, regain if we have lost. I'm not certain that we have. Uh, I know that some are making that claim. I have, uh, I have learned about the scourge of abortion from a Catholic nurse back in the 1970s. I have learned and have continued to have robust relationships with Catholic priests and friends across the country. The Reverend Troy Gately, Frank Rossi, Bill Young, Michael Barrett, Oscar Cantu, now Bishop, Brendan Cahill, Mario Arroyo, and more recently, the good father, Don Nesty. But I am grateful for this opportunity. I, I want to share with you a few things tonight about Paul and his gospel. I really look forward to your questions. Uh, your questions are, are going to uh, no doubt hit uh, uh, ideas that you care deeply about. I hope to hear some of the questions I heard in the earlier because I have different answers for those questions. <laughs> and, I, and I sat down there on my hands a couple of times. And, oh, I did, but anyway, it, but, 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 but they're, not, but they're answers, answers I, I think that, that will resonate with you as, as we, we talk together. But if you'll permit this, uh, this Catholic Baptist uh, who believes in one holy Catholic apostolic church to borrow King Agrippa's line when he's talking to Paul in Acts. I am almost persuaded now by, by very much and, and we, we have to, to have continue to have these great conversations about the meaning and the purpose of the gospel. Let me, um, let me make sure our technology is going to work here. I, uh, I have chosen as a title Paul's gospel changing lives and transforming culture and as I began to prepare I had a bit of a change of heart about that the subtitle and uh, the subtitle I would like to change to is this notion of of uh, creating uh, a case for the, the church as a cruciform community I want to use that language a little bit later on and try to ex uh, Exp uh, expound upon that. Th uh, four th three things I want to do tonight. I took one of these off because it's already long, but uh, you'll be happy. I shortened it. Uh, number one, I want to consider the nature of Paul's gospel, and I want to do that in conversation with uh, Dr. Witherington as well as the others who have, who have come before us, Dr. Ryan and uh, Dr. Ozick. Uh, I want to add some things and, and clarify some things from my point of view about what we've heard there. I want to ask the question from Paul's perspective um, what on earth is God up to? I think it's a good question to ask. When Paul saw what was happening, when he had the Christophany, that experience of the risen Jesus, what did he think God was doing? What on earth 
is God up to? And I think it's a good question for us to ask constantly. Very often we plan something, we put it together, and we ask God to bless it. Wouldn't it be interesting to find out what God is doing and for us to join him in it? It's a different perspective. What is God up to? Let's find it. Let's join him in there. And then finally, I want to make a church, the case the church is to be rightfully understood as a cruciform, countercultural community that calls people to a new, a different kind of existence. And I hope to do that in three hours. I mean, with the, in about uh, 45, 45 minutes here with you this evening. The, uh, just a few preliminary things, and I want to do this in terms of the language of the gospel. The word gospel, as you well know, euangelion, evangelion, depending upon your pronunciation, is used by Paul in the 40s and 50s. For him, uh, the gospel was, was simply the word good news, favorable report. It is later in the second century that the word gospel took on this, this other range of meaning that is a book about Jesus or a, a, a Jesus book. And this, this is a little image that I love. It's of P52. This is the earliest fragment of any New Testament writing we have. It comes from the early 2nd century. It's on, uh, you can't see it now, but it's in the John Rylands Library in Manchester, England. I had the privilege of seeing it back in 2000. What's amazing about this little bit of the gospel is that it contains on the recto side the question, what is truth, by Pilate to Jesus. What is truth? Little, little fragment about the size of the palm of your hand. And also what's interesting about this fragment is most papyri begin to degrade after time and turn very dark. This one is still that color. It's a beautiful, beautiful artifact. The earliest manuscript we have of any New Testament writing, the gospel, a portion of the gospel of John. But initially, the word gospel just means good news, favorable report. And that's how Paul began to use it. He received that primarily from, that understanding primarily from reading the Old Testament. Uh, the scripture that I want to point you to this evening is from the Isaiah chapter 40, where Paul says, prepare, or, or excuse me, Paul, Isaiah says, prepare the way of the Lord. Now notice the word Lord there. What does it look like? It's all capitals. Now, the reason it's all capitals, because in a good translation, it's telling you that beneath that is the divine name, the holy, ineffable, unspeakable name of God, the Yod, the He, the Vav, the He, the word that, that, we, that we as Christians should speak only sparingly. Prepare the way of the Lord, Hashem, the name. We think perhaps it was, trans, it was pronounced something like Yahweh. But we're not sure. Prepare the way of Yahweh. He's coming. He's on the move. Isaiah saw this in his day. God is on the move. He's coming. The second part, verse 5, the glory of the Lord, Hashem, the ineffable name of God, ineffable name of God, the glory of the Lord is going to be revealed. This is an apocalyptic idea. The revelation, it will be unveiled. And then verse 9, get you up to the high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up and do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Now think about Isaiah's word here. I, Isaiah is telling us that God is on the move. God is coming the way must be prepared. A bit later, there's another passage, Isaiah 52. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news and announcing salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. This is the good news. When Paul talks about the gospel, I can't help but think that he has Isaiah in mind, that God is on the move in his day, that God is active the long period of heavenly silence has come to an end. And God is on the move once again. He's ready to reign. So what we see in Paul's writing after the Christophany, after the event that changed his life, that reoriented his life, whether you call it a conversion or a call, I think it's probably both, Paul had a new vocation. He had a new path for life. He considered himself the herald of this gospel, 
The Lord is indeed coming. And in fact, he would say, has come in Jesus, the Messiah. The true king is ready to take now his throne. And the long period of exile, the long period of exile has finally come to an end. This is what Paul thinks is happening. That the vision of Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah, what Isaiah had seen hundreds of years before was actually coming true and had become true. And that the new creation was already started. It had been realized in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. When we move to another kind of culture, the Greco-Roman culture of the day, the word gospel is also current. And the word gospel there, again, is a technical term. And it seems to mean something like a military victory or a, a, a new king, a new emperor has been born or a new king has ascended the throne, a new emperor has come. And all of that was accompanied in that time with the word good news. This is the gospel. Here's, here's a coin of, uh, this is uh, Marcus Aurelius, I think, a coin, a, a denaria, a silver denaria from roughly the second century. It's a beautiful coin. And... Uh, we learn a lot by looking at the coinage from the periods. Again, primary evidence of that day. Here's a passage I'd like for us to look at, an inscription from the 9th, uh, 9 BC. This was found uh, just a few years ago and has been recently published. And this is what outsiders, this is what pagans, if you will, this is what the Greeks, the Romans, would have thought about this notion of good news. This is what they would have thought about an emperor who had taken the throne, who had ascended to the throne. Providence has ordained it. And if you'll notice, he has ordained the most perfect consummation for human life by giving to it Augustus, by filling him with virtue for doing the work of a benefactor among men, and by sending in him, in Augustus, as it were, a savior for us, and those who come after us to cause wars to cease, to create order out of disorder. The birthday of the God Augustus was the beginning for the world of glad tidings that has come to men through him. This is what, when they thought of the gospel, when they thought of the word euangelion, this is how they thought. They thought a benefactor has come, a God has been born, a savior is there for us, Wars will cease. Peace will finally come. Order will, become, will come out of disorder. Truly a God has been born in our midst. This is the Greco-Roman version. Well, when we ask the question, well, what was more important to Paul? His Jewish background or the Greco-Roman background? Well, we can answer one way or another. Perhaps it's, though, the wrong question. Maybe the question ought to be, the one down below. How did Paul use the term? You see, the origin of a word and the philology of the word and the etymology of the word is sometimes not how a word itself is used. Paul used the word uniquely. So we need to pause a moment and say, how did Paul himself use the term, the term gospel? Here's a couple of passages. Somebody mentioned to me tonight, I'm coming to hear a Baptist. I didn't bring my Bible. What's wrong with that? So there's plenty of Bible on the screen. Don't worry about it. 1 Thessalonians 2.9. Remember our labor, Paul writes to the people of Thessalonica. Brothers and sisters, we work night and day so that we might not burden any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God, the good news of God. Remember, God is on the move, right? Remember, a new king is about to ascend the throne. Remember, order will now come out of disorder. Paul says in Romans 1 that Paul serves God by announcing the gospel of his son. Paul was able to use the word gospel both with the God and his son. I think there's a reason for that that we might get into tonight if we have time. For Paul, the gospel is a narrative proclamation. It is that which we need to proclaim and speak and bear witness to. It is not a list of propositions. It's not a list of big ideas that we all sign off on. It is the story of God's love. It's the story of his encounter with the world from the beginning, from creation to the consummation, the final, the second coming of Jesus. Paul's gospel, as Michael Gorman says, depends upon this great master story 
of what God is up to in the world. Understanding where the world has been. Understanding where the world is going to one of these days when Christ returns. Paul says, we need to understand that story. I want to tell you that story. In the book of Mark, if you will, the Mark begins the beginning of the, the good news, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It's a very simple sentence. The beginning of the gospel. The word gospel there doesn't mean book about Jesus. It means the beginning of the good news. For Mark, the entire life of Jesus was the beginning of the gospel. And I would suggest to you that what Mark wants us to understand, what Paul wants us to understand is that we continue telling the good news. We're a part of that story. We are to take up that story. We're to tell that story. We're to declare it. We're to live it. And that's what our churches are to be all about, telling the good news, the story and of what God is doing through Christ. In Romans 1, here's how it begins. Perhaps Paul's most famous letter. Paul, a servant of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he, God, promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now notice the darker text here. This gospel is concerning his son, who descended from David, according to the flesh, was declared, or horistentis, he was appointed or fixed to be the Son of God with power. I suggest that's how we should read that text. He is the Son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of dead, the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For Paul, there were two stages to the sonship of Jesus. That the gospel consisted of two stages. One, the earthly life of Jesus. We could call that, if you will, according to the flesh. Here, flesh is not contrary to the spirit. It's just the human life. According to the human perspective, according to what we know by genealogy, Jesus was the son of David. He was the son of God. And I have no doubt that he has in mind 2 Samuel chapter 7, which was the beginning of the messianic promise, where Nathan said to King David, you're not going to build the temple, but your son will build the temple. And your son will carry on a dynasty, a dynasty that will never end. And I will be to him a father and he will be to me a son. David, your son will be a son to me. The language of the sonship of God, the son of God is initially a messianic title. That the son of God is to be the son of David. The son of David is to be the son of God because God has adopted him into his, as it were, family. That's the original meaning. We see that particularly as it's appropriated in 1 Chronicles as that same passage is retold time and time again. So in the flesh, in the human issue of life, Jesus is the son of God as the son of David. But then there's a second level. Rev it up a little bit. Take it to the next level. According to the Spirit, the work of the Spirit in the resurrection, Jesus is not just the son of David, the expected son of David. The one that, even in the Qumran scrolls and other places, the son of David, the Messiah, the son of God, all that language comes together about the son of David, the Messiah. But he takes it to the next level to say that the son of God empowered is the one that we know. The one who lives on in power. The one who is none other than Jesus Christ our Lord. We're so accustomed to that language. But I'm afraid sometimes we're not sure what it all means. The phrase Jesus Christ. We read it. It's over and over in the scripture. I want to suggest to you. And I know biblical scholars. You probably know those as well. That say Christ is just sort of a second name. It's just become kind of common parlance. Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ. And it doesn't really mean much when Paul uses Jesus Christ. I want to suggest to you that in fact every time you see the phrase Jesus Christ, it's a confession. Saying that Jesus is Hamashiach. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. 
Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one whom God has promised will come. The one who will bring peace. The one who will bring order. The one who will bring right back to life. So when we see that phrase, Jesus Christ, I suggest that in Paul in particular, we read it as Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. As N.T. Wright says, Lord Jesus, the King. I like that. We've expanded on that a little bit in our new translation, the voice, the Lord Jesus, the liberating King, the one who comes to liberate us. For Paul, Jesus is the crucified Messiah, the crucified King, 1 Corinthians. And so therefore, Paul, we know him primarily as a theologian of the cross. It's unfortunate, I think, for us in some ways, the cross has become uh, the kind of symbol it has. Uh, I'm glad to see it on churches. I'm glad to see it on crucifixes. I'm not always happy to see it on jewelry. Not always happy to see it on bumper stickers. I think we've romanticized the cross. I think we've sometimes escaped the true meaning of the cross. When we see the cross, what does it remind us of? Well, for Paul, it reminded him of scandal. It reminded him of bad news. We should never forget that the cross was an instrument of torture. It was an in instrument of death. No different than the hangman's noose, no different than the electric chair, no different than the guillotine. Jesus is the crucified king. Now, how does all that work for Paul? I mean, does it make sense? Jesus, the crucified king, an offense, a scandal to the Jews, to the Greeks, foolishness, utter foolishness why is that well because a king has been defeated a king has been humiliated the one that you call the king is under the curse of God according to Deuteronomy how is it now that this king is the one we should bow before the one we should worship the cross meant shame We've romanticized it. We've beautified it. But in fact, we should never forget that it meant death, humiliation, and defeat. So how for Paul did the crucified Messiah become the Lord of all? Well, we know the answer to that. At least I hope we do. We're in that season. We're moving toward that time. Paul's gospel, 1 Corinthians 15. Let me remind you of it. For I would like to remind you, Paul said, of this gospel, this good news I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, wait a minute. Christ, the, the guy Jesus? No, the Messiah died. And he didn't die just a normal death. He died an atoning death. He doesn't mention the cross here because he's mentioned the cross earlier. He died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and then he appeared. Paul knows nothing, apparently, of the empty tomb. For Paul, the proof that Jesus had conquered death was the resurrection appearances. He frequently alludes to those. He talks about his own Christophany as well. I want to focus in upon a moment for that phrase, according to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, raised the third day according to the scriptures. Now, I'm Baptist. As a Baptist, I'm sort of hardwired to say, well, show me that passage in the scripture. Where does it say that the Messiah is going to die on behalf of sins? In the scripture. Now, by scripture, Paul means what? the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. That's what we, we would refer to it, or as I prefer to call it, the Classic Testament. I don't like the Old Testament. I don't like that term. And the reason for that is when I talk to students today in this culture, you say, when I say Old Testament, what do you hear? Worn out, used up, yesterday's news. That's what people hear. That's not the way Jesus thought about those books. 
That's not the way Paul thought about those books. I, I suggest we retire the phrase Old Testament for classic testament. I like that better. You don't have to, but I, I'm going to. <laughs> but t take a look at this for just a moment. That, that the Messiah died for sins according. Now, here's what I, I, I'll, I'll in, in, ask you to do. Go back to the, to the Bible and start in Genesis, read through Malachi, and find a passage that clearly and unequivocally says that the Messiah is going to die on behalf of sins. You won't be able to find it. I want to ask you that you go and likewise do the same thing. Go find a passage that say the Messiah is going to be raised from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures, right? You won't find it. So what is Paul doing? Well, he's not proof texting. He's not saying, look, you can go back there and find a passage like this. Let me suggest what he's doing here. Paul is saying that what we find happening in the death and the burial of Jesus is the, the climax of God's covenant, the perfect end to a story that we start. Have you ever been to a movie or had an experience of a book where at the very end, all the different pieces of the book, you, you couldn't follow the story, the story was this way and that, and finally when you came to the end, you said, oh, I see now. This is that moment for Paul. When he saw the risen Jesus, when he saw and understood that the crucified Messiah was now the living Lord, I am confident that after he sort of picked himself up off the ground, it took a little while, but he said, I see it now. It is the perfect end to the perfect story of God's ongoing love for us. That the Messiah died. You can't find an exact passage that says that. The other thing we could say that it certainly means is that the death of the Messiah on behalf of sins doesn't contradict Scripture at all. It's perfectly consonant with the story that God. Well, you say, well, what about Isaiah 53, the, the, the suffering servant? And said, well, that's fine, but that's the suffering servant, not the Messiah. Those are different texts. But in Christianity, what happens is these first Christians who were, the, were Jews were pulling together text, different parts of the story, and pulling it together. They, all these lines were converging at a particular moment, the moment that we know as Good Friday and Easter. Paul understood that the death of the Messiah, that the resurrection of the Messiah, was the climax of God's covenant story with his people. It is in the resurrection that God has turned the world upside down. That God has defeated the powers. On Easter, the curse is reversed. And the one who had been humiliated, shamed, is vindicated and given honor and given the name that is above every name. Paul believed the world, maybe differently than we do, was populated with all sorts of powers, spiritual powers, like sin, for example, and perhaps demonic, dark powers. These powers could not be tamed, nor would they be placated. That was Paul's world. Now, we can accept that as modern people. We can set it aside as modern people. But I would suggest there's something to his understanding of the world. Human society for Paul had fallen prey to the God of this world. Listen to that language. The God of this world. Not the God of creation, but the God who actually ran this world. And these spiritual powers are manifesting themselves in political and in perhaps religious ways in Paul's day. So what on earth is God up to? Let me see if I can get to that. I think it's a good question. When Paul finally figured it out, all these lines converging from the Old Testament story, when Paul had said, I know now that Christ is the end of the law, not the terminus, not the end as in it's over, but Christ is the goal of what the law was all about. Christ, when he saw that, I'm fairly confident that, I, that we, we have a good understanding today of the kind of notion that was in Paul's mind. Let me show it to you in this way. 
let me, let me, let me, a few things about this diagram. Paul was a Jew, right? We talked a little bit about that last week. Dr. Ryan did a good job with that. I want to outline for you a Jewish apocalyptic view of eschatology. Eschatology means uh, the study of last, final, or ultimate things. Eschatology can come in all sorts of varieties. There's individual eschatology, that is death. What happens at death? Then there's cosmic eschatology. What happens to the cosmos, the world? Paul had developed, along with the Jews at this time, a view of history that was what? Linear. History was not a series of circles just going, I'll go over here, right? Over and over and over. That was not Paul's world at all. Paul believed that history had a beginning, that's C, that's creation on this far end, and that it had a goal that it was moving toward. This was Paul's understanding, and that there were two ages. History consisted of two ages. Now, we know this from a series of things Paul says and what are things that are said in Paul's uh, culture. The old age, as we might call it, was going to one day be eclipsed by the new age. Notice that the line from the end, is that working? There we go, comes down. This is the apocalyptic view. The apocalyptic view is not that, okay, we're all going to try harder and we're going to make the world better together. That's not the apocalyptic view. The apocalyptic view said this, that if there is any hope for this world, it must be from heaven to earth. God must come and help us. God must come and save us. God must come and rescue us. This is what Paul believed. So there are two periods of history. One is this old age. The people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumran sect, called this the Age of Wrath. It's interesting that Paul talked about it similarly. But now he says in Romans 1, the wrath of God is revealed in this, in this place, in this, in this planet. Paul also called it in uh, Galatians 1 verse 3, the present evil age. Now think about this. This is the age of wrath. This is the age where evil dominates. This is the age, Paul would say, um, in another way, that the God of this world has blinded the eyes of many. And yet, one day, from the top down, either God himself was on the move to come or God's Messiah was going to show up. Some Jewish texts call about, talk about a Messiah coming. Others do not. They talk about the Lord himself coming. Isaiah, of course, the Lord comes. To interrupt history, to turn everything upside down, to bring about a new age. Age of Aquarius. No, not really. Age of Aquarius. The rabbis called it the Ha'olam Haba, the world that is to come. Jesus called it the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God and the teaching of Jesus is simply this, the time and place in human history when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? The time and place in human history. Notice the question, what on earth is God doing? The focus of the gospel is not, how do I get to heaven? How do I get out of here? How can I get out of this? This is a bad place. How can I get out of here as quick as possible? The gospel is about repairing the world, changing the world, turning the world upside down, but we don't do it on our own. We do it from the top down. Now, this is the simple idea of what the, uh, 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 it's kind of apocalyptic thinking. History consists of two ages. The first age, ultimately to be eclipsed by God's action, either in himself or the Messiah. And uh, if we were to characterize it this way, the old age is, a, is an age of war, right? What's it good for? The age of war, conflict, the age of disease, disease, famine, running rapid, the age of evil, crime, natural disaster. This is what that age looks like. But what will this age to come look like? Well, according to the prophets, look like this. War gives way to what? peace. What does Isaiah say? There's coming a time when they will take their swords and spears and beat them into plowshares and pruning hooks. And in that day, they will learn of war no more. 
That's Isaiah's vision. Paul thinks that day has already started. Take a look at what happens. Instead of disease, what is there? Health, healing. Instead of natural disaster and, and, and us and nature sort of being at odds, there's harmony. What does Isaiah say? There's coming a day when the lion lays down with the lamb. Now, I've seen enough National Geographic to know what lions usually do to lambs, right? And wildebeest and the like. But God says through the prophet, there's coming a day when there will be harmony, when the little boy will play outside of the adder's den and not be afraid, the adder, the viperous, venomous snake. No worries. It's a new world. It's a peaceable kingdom. This is the world that is coming. This is the vision that is propelling Isaiah for the world that is to come, the kingdom of God. Well, we immediately have a problem, don't we? Messiah has come. This, by the way, is why Jews say the Messiah has not come. Right? Th they accept this. This vision of history is correct. But you Christians say the Messiah has come. Wait a minute. Why are there still wars? Why is there still famine? There's a story in the Talmud about a rabbi who uh, his students, he's in, in, the, in, his, in his office studying Torah. And the students come knocking and say, Rabbi, Rabbi, the Messiah is here. The Messiah is here. And he gets up kind of slowly. He's got a little bit of age, kind of like me. Gets up kind of slowly, moves over to the window, looks out, and he sees two boys fighting on the playground. And he goes back, takes a seat, seat, starts studying Torah again. Rabbi, Rabbi, the Messiah is here. He said, no, he's not. He said, if the Messiah was, was here, there would be no fighting on the playground. The vision of the kingdom of God is the cessation of war, the creation of peace, doing away with disorder, bringing order, bringing righteousness. This is what the world is to be like. Let me give you a more complicated vision. Now, I've actually toned this one down a little bit. Um, it essentially says the same thing. But now, instead of one coming of the Messiah, Paul knew the Messiah was coming twice. It's the same vision. There is an old age. There is a new age. One will eclipse the other. But the old age that starts at creation when, human, when humans disobeyed God, when the world became contrary, when the, the divisions and separations began, that age continues until the second coming, at which point it is completely and totally done with. But the kingdom of God, the new age, has begun in the incarnation, in the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So the kingdom of God has begun, started here. And the beginning of the end of time, not the end, it's over, but the change. The goal of history has now been realized. What history has been all about, what God has been all about, is coming true in these, in these days. And so what we have is what, what, what I like to call this period of overlap where the two ages. Jesus told a parable once about the, the kingdom of God is like a field in which there are weeds and wheat growing. Remember that parable? The weeds and the wheat are growing side by side. Well, who's weeds? Who's wheat? How do we know? And so the weeds and the wheat are growing together and the workers say, well, should we go out and uproot the weeds? And the wise farmer says, no, because in uprooting the weeds, you'll also destroy the wheat. Let both of them exist together until the end and I will send out the harvesters and we will gather together the wheat and they will go into the barns. We will gather together the, the weeds and they will, will be burned and destroyed. I think Paul knew that parable. I think he understood it well. This is what God is up to. God has entered the world, and in the first and in the second comings of Jesus, God was righting the world, repairing the world, turning it upside down, exchanging evil for good, exchanging 
disease for health, exchanging war for peace. Well, that's the vision, I think, that propels Paul. Paul goes on to write about this simply saying, All in Adam die. All in Christ shall be made alive. There are two ages of history, but there are also two humanities. One humanity constituted in Adam. The other humanity constituted in Christ. All in Adam die. All in Christ shall be made alive at the parousia, of the second coming. All will be living again. Two humanities existing side by side. Those who are in Adam are destined for destruction. Those in Christ are destined for eternity. When I first wrote this, I said the society of Adam is destined. And then I said the society of Jesus destined for eternity. But I thought maybe that wouldn't work. I don't know why, but is that... Is that Anyway, those who are in Christ, all of us who find our meaning, our existence in Christ are destined for eternity. The question is, and for Paul, what ministry is, is calling people out of the old age into the new. Take a look at Paul's statement here in 2 Corinthians. If anyone is in Christ, there is this new creation. The old is and has begun to pass away. The new has come. It's not that we're waiting for it. It's already begun. All this is from God who reconciled, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Ministry to society is about calling people to a new life telling them the story of God's love, leaving the results to God to call people to this reconciled, changed, holy life, all done through Christ. What in the world is God up to? One other thing I want to point out very quickly. I wish we had more time for this. Notice in verse 20, through him, through Jesus, who is the head of the church, who is the firstborn of those who have been resurrected. Through him, God intends to reconcile the tapanta, all things. The reconciliation of creation has begun, and the church is the first part of that. God's purpose is to restore and repair all of the cosmos. And you and I and the church, the body of Christ, is the first deposit on that future that's his goal this is what God is up to and so Paul enjoy, uh, enjoins his readers and, and when he shares the gospel in Colossians here Jesus is the one who has delivered us from this domain of darkness they has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son listen to that language kingdom son transferred delivered us from darkness. Paul sees that the, the age itself has turned and we now are being called to live in this redeemed, forgiven life. In Galatians, once again, verse, I guess, uh, verse 4, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, the evil that we see around us, according now to the will of of God. Very quickly, just a few metaphors for salvation. Just about done. A couple more ideas. When he speaks about salvation, how does he do it? Salvation for Paul is this amazing category. Not one word will do it. So he talks about justification. Through Christ, we're putting to a positive, a right relationship with God. God doesn't just declare us right. I think Luther was wrong at that point. Can I say that? <laughs> I think Luther was wrong about that. It's not just we're declared. We are truly in the process of being transformed and made right. That's what God's up to. It's not enough just to say the sinner has been, vindic has been justified. The sinner is not guilty. In initially, perhaps. But God does not leave us in that state. 
Redemption, the act by which slaves are set free. Through Christ, God releases us from the powers, and particularly the power of sin that keeps us in bondage. One of my favorite ones is adoption. The act by which orphans are made part of the family. Paul doesn't use this metaphor very often, but he uses it in a few key places in Romans and Galatians to make us, to make outsiders, insiders. To make those who are far away, close at hand. To make us part of his family. And reconciliation, the act by which two estranged parties are brought together once again. Through Christ, this reconciliation is taking place. And there are more metaphors. We, we, could, we could add more and more to that. Well, so what now? That's the question. God is calling us. The gospel is this. The clarion call to come out of Adam and Adam's destiny and Adam's future and enter into this kingdom of Christ. The church, the ecclesia, are those who've heard the call and said yes to the call. Many are called, few are chosen, the state says the way it says, but, but all are called. I'm convinced that all are called. But not everybody will say yes to the call. The gospel is our pleading with people to say yes to God's invitation, yes to God's call. So this is how Paul puts it in Romans 12. One of my favorite passages. I appeal to you. I, I've, I've changed up this translation just a little bit. I, I appeal to you, I beg of you, I, 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 I plead with you, brothers and sisters, in view of all of God's mercies. And I would argue that from Romans 1 to Romans 11, we have a catena, a catalog, a listing of how God has been merciful over and over again. In view of all of God's mercy, now so what? We are to present our bodies a living sacrifice to become his hands, his feet, his eyes, his ears, his mouthpiece. That is worship. When we present our bodies a living sacrifice. Now that's kind of an odd phrase, a living sacrifice. It's kind of like a Catholic Baptist or Baptist Catholic. I don't know. It's kind of odd. But, but in fact, for Paul, it made perfectly good sense because what happened in Christ was a living sacrifice. Christ had become that sacrifice who now was alive again by the resurrection. And you and I can present to God in view of his mercies, can present our bodies to him as a living sacrifice and we can get up and live on and live in his name again and, and continue to live that way. So Paul pleads, do not be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I would suggest to you, uh, I found this the other day. I thought this was, this was kind of fun. Um, this is from despair.com. I need to give them credit. A poster I saw the other day, conformity. When people are free to do as they please, they usually imitate somebody else, right? Somebody else. Paul understood this. Moralists of the day understood this. You and I may not understand this, understand this quite so well. That human personality, human lives, human societies consist primarily in imitation. The question is, who will you imitate? You will conform yourself to something. Choose wisely. Choose wisely. So for Paul, conform yourself to the image and the likeness of Christ. A couple of passages, Romans 8, just very briefly. Those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to his image. That's the goal of discipleship. That's the goal of the gospel. It's to take people who are very much unlike Christ, who are unloving, unforgiving, to make them loving and forgiving. To take us and to change us. The goal of discipleship is to make us like Jesus. To conform us to his image. His likeness. He, our elder brother. So Paul's gospel is covenantal. I'll just give you a few terms here. It calls us into a relationship with God. It's communal. 
It calls us to live out our lives together. There's no individuals in the kingdom. We're all together in it, right? We, the gospel is personal, as we'll see in a, moment, as a slide in a moment. It, it's personal, but it's not individual. He calls us as persons. We experience it not as individuals, but together. Paul's gospel is cruciform. It calls us to shape our lives around the cross. Paul says that we are to put on Christ. Paul says that we are to be baptized in his name, which means, Romans 6, what? Have not we been baptized into his death? The Christian life begins in identification with his death, his burial, his resurrection. So the gospel is covenantal, it's communal, it calls us to live cross-shaped lives, a different sort of life. And I want to conclude by doing a reading, it's okay, from this translation that we just got through working on called The Voice. I want to read to you a passage that typifies what I'm trying to suggest tonight about what the gospel will do for a people. In Philippians 2, um, Paul quotes a hymn, an early Christian hymn. It's a beautiful hymn, but before he sets it up, before he tells the hymn, he sets it up in this way. He says, if you find any comfort from being in the liberator, the Messiah, if his love brings you any encouragement, if you experience true companionship with the Spirit, if his tenderness and mercy fill your heart, then, brothers and sisters, here is one thing that would complete my joy. Come together, Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, come together in one mind, one spirit, and one purpose, sharing in the same love. Don't let selfishness and prideful agendas take over. Embrace true humility and lift your heads to extend love to others. We will get nowhere if our motives spring from selfish ambition or indifference to the plight of those around us. Get beyond yourselves and protecting your own interests. Be sincere and secure your neighbor's interest first. Do you hear those words? Wouldn't it be amazing to be a part of a people, Father Brendan, like this? To be a part of a people who do nothing, nada, not one thing from selfishness or personal agenda. How could the world be without that? I heard a story about a young woman who um, discovered, been married two years, discovered she was pregnant. She was very excited about it. She was going to have a romantic dinner, dinner with her husband that night. So she stopped at the grocery store on the way home to pick up a few items from the grocer to have a nice romantic dinner to tell him the good news that they were going to have a, a child. So she got in line checking out behind a woman who had five kids all under the age of seven. <laughs> and, and the woman, the mother of these children was just fit to be tied. Uh, the kids were poking each other and pulling at the magazines and the candy and fussing. And, and the mother had this just far away look in her eye, right? Take me away, Calgon, please. <laughs> well, the, the young mother-to-be was a bit upset by that. She was concerned by that. So uh, the next time she went to her doctor, she said, Doctor, I don't want my child to turn out to be a monster. What do I do? And so the doctor said, well, what I want you to do is three times a day, I want you to rub your tummy and say, baby, baby, be a nice baby. You know, they can hear you in there, right? So three times a day, rub your tummy and say, baby, baby, be a nice baby. Baby, baby, be a nice baby. So she did that. In her fourth month, she discovered she's having twins. Went back to the doctor and said, doctor, what do I do? I'm having twins. She said, well, you've been doing it three times a day? I said, yeah, up it to six. <laughs> okay, so six times a day, rub your tummy and say, baby, baby, be a nice baby. Baby. So she did this throughout her whole pregnancy. In the ninth month, the babies didn't come. 
The 10th month, the babies didn't come. In the 11th month, still, the babies did not come. So the doctor said, we got to go in there and get those babies. So they opened her up. One was saying to the other, after you. No, I insist, after you. No, please, after you. Now, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be amazing to be a part of a people like that? Where no one is driven by selfish interest. Listen to how Paul concludes that. That plea, that, 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 that prayer. He says this, and, and this is the poetry part. Um, I worked on this with a, a local poet named Kelly Hall, and she helped me see it in a more poetic sense. Though he was in the form of God. Paul says, let me back up. Says, in other words, adopt this mindset of Jesus the liberating king. Live with his attitude in your hearts. And here's the poem. Though he was in the form of God, he chose not to cling to equality with God, but poured himself out to fill a vessel brand new, a servant in form, and a man indeed, the very likeness of humanity. He humbled himself, obedient to death, a merciless death on the cross. So God raised him up, to the highest place and gave him the name above all. So when his name is called, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth below and every tongue will confess, Jesus, the liberating king, is Lord to the glory of God our Father. May the Lord be with you as we conform ourselves to his image and his likeness in response, faithful response to his gospel. Thanks very much. Well, you mentioned at the beginning that you had uh, listened to some of the questions in the prior presentations and that there are some that you would answer differently. So pick one of those questions and how would you answer oh. it differently? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, just one? Uh, okay. Um, Dr. Ozick was asked about the title Kurios, Lord as Applied I don't know if you heard that question. Somebody asked. It was really two questions. One asked about a high Christology, remember that, and a low Christology. Um, let, me, let me see if I can explain that. She, she suggested that the title Kurios applied to Jesus did not reflect a notion of his divinity. I would disagree. And, and I would disagree for a lot of things. We have more than just the title Kurios being associated with Jesus. We have a whole... A constellation of religious practices being associated with Jesus. People are baptized into his name. Hymns are being composed in his honor. A moment ago I read from Philippians 2 that says that at the parousia every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess, confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now if that religious devotion is appropriate at the eschaton, isn't it also appropriate now? to bow and call him Lord. And by the way, that language, every knee will bow and every tongue confess, comes right out of Isaiah 45, 23, which is the most stridently monotheistic passage in the Hebrew Bible, in the classic testament. It's, it's the most, which, which says, I am God and there is no other. Every knee will bow to me. And now God, according to Paul, has directed that that same worship be given to Jesus. I would suggest that the title Kurios associated does, is not just sir or master or good teacher, though I, I'm, I'm ready for my students to call me master anytime if they wish. <laughs> uh, they don't usually. They call me other things. But um, I do think that the title Kurios, as Paul used it, reflects a high Christology. That is, the very first writing theologian sees Jesus as Lord. That is, the name of God, Hashem, being associated with Jesus. There are 14 times in Paul's letters where Paul takes what I call an Old Testament Yahweh text, a passage that has the divine name and associates those and, and, and quotes those. Seven of those 14 he associates with Jesus. And Isaiah 
45, 23 is one of those. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess to Jesus Lord. So I would answer that differently. That the very first theologian writing in the 50s, probably even by 34 or 35 when he's converted, already has a sense that Jesus is more than a prophet. He's more than Hamashiach, the Messiah. He is more than a, a good teacher. He is the Lord God in the flesh. Uh, that's how I would answer that. So that's one. Thank you. Thank you. And it just so happens the person actually asks the same question. <laughs> oh. When Paul says Jesus is Lord, Jesus is curious, does he mean Jesus is God? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think he does. Uh, th now, that doesn't mean that Paul somehow confuses Jesus and God in some way. The, the lines between them is diffuse. I I'm, I'm confident that Paul understood and we see in other places that the, subord the Son is subordinate to the Father. But we see this in John's Gospel, don't we? The Gospel supposedly of the highest Christology in John and, and various places that the Son is subordinate to the Father. Paul sees that. He sees them as separate and yet one. And that is the mystery of the Trinity. So uh, I, would, I would again affirm that. Thank you. The next question is, uh, you stated that God's intention is for us to be united. So why do we oppose this purpose by separating ourselves with different denominations? Yeah, good question. <laughs> I tell you what, let's decide right now that we're going to have one church and you guys come and join mine, okay? Would you, <laughs> can we do that? You know, that, would, that, yeah, you know, that is a tough question. I, I do think in the economy of God and the vision of God, the church is one. There was one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Um, there are some brothers and sisters in different places, and um, there are probably historically good reasons for these divisions. Uh, I am thinking that in these days that we're living in, that God may be doing something else, that we are living in a, a, almost a, um, I don't use the term reformation here, but a reformation moment in which exciting, wonderful things are happening among denominations, where we are able to see and move and work toward this oneness. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think, we, I think we're, we're seeing that. Um, I think that is what God's heart is for us. And if we were to say, what is God on earth up to? I think we would figure a way out. Maybe not to everybody come to my church or your church or any one particular, but that we would figure a way out to the center. To, to the one true living God. Thank you. Yes, sir. This one has a series of questions, but they sort of tie together. Okay. What is our, roles as, our role as members of the body of Christ, his church, in this transitional age? Do you believe good works for transforming this world matters, or is it just grace? And who do we fight if we must? Power, dominations, or just our basic instincts or bad social structures? Wow. Um, go back to the first part of the question first. What, what, is, what is our role as members of the body of Christ, his church, in this transitional age? Yeah. Um, I mean, there are a series of things there. I, I, want to, I want to go back to a thing that I said earlier. That, that I think essentially that we have a disposition to the church that we need. Ministry primarily is what we do with each other, one another. But we have a different disposition to those on the outside. And, and ultimately, from Paul's perspective, we are in sharing the gospel and bearing witness to, what God, to the great story of God's love. In doing that, we are to, again, call people to this other kind of life. We are to model that. Remember, Paul was the person that said... Um, imitate me because I imitate Christ. Now think about that for a moment. Think about the audaciousness of that claim in our day and time. Imitate me because I imitate Christ. I think that our role is to be the best darn model of who Jesus is and to say to the world, imitate me. Do what I do. In Philippians 2, 4, Paul says, um, the things that you've learned and seen in me, do those things and the, love of, and, the, and the peace of God will be with you. Imagine that. We say, don't put me on a pedestal. Don't do what I do. 
we want to remove ourselves from that. Paul was audacious in saying, put me on that pedestal. Make me that model. I will be that for you because I am imitating Christ. I don't think that's braggadocious. That is boasting, but that is a very bold move because Paul knew what we have forgotten. We need models for imitation. And so I think our role is to, is to be the best darn models we can be in, in living out this Christian faith. And others will see that, and whether they know it or not, they will soon find themselves imitating what we do, what we say, how we live, how we deal with one another. So I don't know if that helps at all. Yes, sir. You get more to that second question. He, he answered it. Okay, thanks. You noted that the ninth, uh, that the nine BC inscription to Augustus, where he is called Savior, and given uh, various accolades. Yes. Some use such as evidence that early Christianity just copied these ideas. What is your response to this argument? Yeah, um, there, that, that's that. It was really, really the argument of Reitzenstein and others, and what's called the history of religions movement uh, in the early part of the 1900s that said that, okay, uh, if we're going to understand a religion, we have to understand the different other religions that are like that. So let's compare Christianity to Roman religion and, and emperor worship and the, the cult of Mithra and Osiris and others and see if we can find corollaries. Well, well we, do sign, we, we do find some things that are similar. The question is, is there borrowing from that or is it more likely that what Christianity comes from is its Jewish background. If you have had the opportunity, I hope you will go down to the Houston Museum of Natural Science and see the birth of Christianity, a Jewish story. I would argue that everything we see in Christianity, all the religious devotion and such to Christ, the practices of the meals, uh, the way they live out their lives, the ethics, really find its analogy in Second Temple apocalyptic Judaism. The same kind of Judaism, by the way, we see among the Dead Sea Scrolls. I could read to you this evening some of the Dead Sea Scrolls and you would swear that I'm reading from Paul about grace, about God's love. I believe that there, the sharing that goes on comes from Judaism to Christianity, not the pagan religions. Although we do see some language similar among the, the Greeks, the Romans, the pagans. There is similar language. And C.S. Lewis makes the argument that the reason that we see all of these dying and rising God myths and such and, 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 these, uh, and virgin births, which you see uh, in, in certain Greek myths, is because Jesus and the Christian faith is the myth that became true. That ultimately the longings that we see in the mythology of the Greeks and the Romans, these folks are longing for God. And as Augustine said, there is this longing that God has put in us and it will not rest until we rest in you. Uh, that longing is reflected in the religion of the Roman Empire. And so Christianity comes along to complete that, to fulfill it in a way. So I would argue that all of, the, all of that which... Um, uh, all of that which you see in Christianity that looks like some other religion really is common to the world at the time. You can find elements of that in Judaism, Christianity, and the pagan religions at the time. But it's a good question. It really is a good question. But it really is a question that scholars have moved beyond after the 1940s and 50s when W.D. Davies and others helped us understand that Paul really was a Jew, that Jesus really was a Jew. There were scholars of the 18th and 19th century that said Jesus was a good guy. Jews are not so good. How could Jesus be a Jew? We've already decided that Jews are an inferior race. I'm serious when I say that. This is what led to the Holocaust, this kind of thinking. Jesus is our hero. He's a good guy. Paul's a good guy. They couldn't have gotten anything from Judaism because we know what Jews are like. And unfortunately, it is the anti-Semitism of the Enlightenment and the post-Enlightenment that gave us, I think, a lot of bad scholarship in the early part of the 1900s. That, uh, and, it, and it took the Holocaust and the Second World War, and it took some scholars who would be willing to say, yeah, I see 
Judaism all over the New Testament. Every writer was a Jew. Every, um, what do they quote? They don't quote the pagan writers. They quote the Old Testament, right? All of that can be found, I think, in the scriptures, in Second Temple apocalyptic Judaism. Thanks. Yeah. In Corinthians, when Paul says women should cover their heads, what does he mean? Um, wow. Uh, you know, there, there are, there are uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, I think is what you're talking about there. Um, I have to have the, the full text in front of me. But Paul is, is trying to order the life of the church in worship. 1 Corinthians is very concerned about the church in worship. There's much there about the Lord's table. There's much there about uh, um, uh, how the Lord's table is to be and how, how the spiritual gifts are to be utilized. But I think in 1 Corinthians 11, he, he's very concerned about worship and things being done in order in worship. And there are certain cultural conventions in cultures about women covering themselves that are reflected in Paul. I think whenever you read scripture, you have to be careful to distinguish between that which is culturally determined and that which might be universally applicable. When Paul talks about slavery, for example, I don't think he's advocating slavery. He, he just recognized it's the reality on the ground. One out of every three people in certain cities were slaves. And so that was Paul's reality. It's not he's advocating slavery. In fact, I think in the book of Philemon, Paul does what he, what he can and begins the process by which slavery is eventually unseated, unestablished, disestablished. Um, so, so all those, those cultural things about the covering of the head, obviously uh, we don't, all churches do that today. We see that in Muslim cultures, Islamic cultures. We see that in, in Judaism, uh, the covering of the head, very often with, in prayer and such. So uh, th these, are, these are cultural conventions, uh, not necessarily to be universally applied. Yeah. Next question. How would Paul have understood the phrase, son of man? Oh, wow. Does he ever use, do you, Judy, does he ever use that phrase? I don't think he ever does. Philip, does he use it? Yeah, he doesn't use the phrase son of man. Uh, um, there's been a lot of ink spilled over the, the title son of man and what it means. Primarily, we see it in the Gospels. We see it in, on the lips of Jesus in the Gospels. Now, some scholars have argued that that's, that's really the early church and not Jesus using that language. Um, I believe the title Son of Man is, goes back to Daniel 7, uh, verses 13 and 14. Again, if, if you allow that Paul is an apocalyptic Jew, Daniel is a very important book for apocalyptic Jews, right? If you look at the books that are most quoted by the New Testament, a number of those have apocalyptic aspects, books of Psalms, books in Isaiah, book of Daniel, book of Zechariah. And in Daniel 7, the Son of Man is a heavenly being who ha has a messianic role. He, he uh, On the clouds, he goes before the Ancient of Days and receives an everlasting kingdom. I think it's a messianic title, but it is also a title probably most properly understood, and, and folks don't, I mean, this is how I see it now. I, I would suggest it is a title of divinity. I've often seen scholars say, well, son of God is about his divinity, son of man is about his humanity. I think it's actually the other way around. The earliest use of the title son of God is a messianic title. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's a, mess, that's a human title. But most usages of the title Son of Man could properly be understood as a divine being to whom God gives an everlasting kingdom. Go back and read Daniel 7, and I think you'll see that. If Paul knew that title, I think that's how he would have read that title. As a messianic figure, yes, but as a divine person um, to whom God had bequeathed, given a, uh, an everlasting kingdom. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. David. Uh, this is Jacob. Hey, Jacob. And I want to say this. Everybody who has asked a question here today and uh, tomorrow and yesterday is a theologian. But now back to my question. My okay. question is this. 
Um, when I first heard your title of Transforming Lives, Transforming Cultures, I thought of this. Um, um, people taking care of uh, their injured children um, um, and not letting society take care of their injured children. Hmm. Uh, like uh, me, uh, I was uh, taking care of myself, but uh, now I'm being taken care of by the state of Texas because I had a head injury. Okay. Mm. And uh, my question is this: um, What what do you think of um, how um, people during Paul's time, Saint Paul's time? thought about uh, the church taking care of the injured people versus the society, the government, um, which was elected by people and not by government, and not, I mean not by God, by right. God, yeah. taking care of uh, injured people, be it physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. Jacob, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, I think Paul's world, we would hardly recognize it today I mean, if, if we were to really see what the Roman Empire was like. Um, that was a brutal place in many ways. Uh, people fended for themselves. They had to take care of themselves. The Roman Empire could care less about the, the injured, the weak. It was about strength. It was about power. It was about pomp and circumstance. Um, it, was about, um, it wasn't about the poor wasn't about the weak or the injured. And I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your injury and, and to know, know, know about that. Um, I do think that, that God has put us in this particular time and place to be here for each other, that the church is here to care for each other, that it is our responsibility through whatever means possible, through charity, through government, through institutions, to help take care of people who have been injured, been hurt. And I think that's a part of what, what God would have us do today. Romans 13 is a great, great example. Paul said that the state uh, effectively is, is instituted by God. Now, we, we, could, we could say, there's a lot we could say and we could question about that, but ultimately that God has allowed these powers to exist for good purposes, to honor those who... Um, uh, and uh, to, 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 to punish those who do what's wrong, but then to benefit those who do what's right. And I know that you in your life try to do what's right every day, don't you? And our responsibility to you as a church and as a people and as a nation is to help take care of you. God would have it that way. And whether we do that through any particular charity or whether we do that through taxes and through government agencies, it is our responsibility to make sure that that gets done. It's not a liberal thing or a conservative thing. I think it's a Christian thing. So I appreciate your question tonight. Thank you. Any more? From the floor. Anybody? There's a question. It's a little bit outside the scope of this. Okay. Um, it says, how come on the radio show, show, uh, show of faith with a priest, rabbi, and minister, the Catholic gets the least amount of talk time? Signed, <laughs> signed uh, Father Brendan Cahill. Father Brendan he puts you up to that. We both did, yeah. That, that you know what? Uh, that, that's a good question. I'll have to, I'll have to take up that up with the station management and see what happens. We're actually this is this is our, our fifth anniversary show coming up this weekend. We're excited. Uh, Father Mario is going to try to get the cardinal to call in. I know he can't be on the show, but uh, he's been on the show with us before as the Archbishop, but we hope he's going to do that. But we have, uh, a part of what we do on the show, if you've, if you've not heard it, is we try to show and demonstrate what it means to be friends across faiths, right? Um, some of my best friends are Baptists, but some, I have great friends who are Jewish, who are Catholic, who are Muslim. And if I can do anything to model in this culture, what it means to have those friendships, to enjoy those, to say this is what the world ought to be and can be, and to call people to that. I want that to happen. And so I want to, I want to thank Father Brendan for that question. <laughs> and uh, and uh, 
for the correction and, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and for his friendship and being a part of it. He's also doing some writing now for the blog that we do for the radio show. So that takes a lot of time as well. I do appreciate, Father Nesty, the opportunity to share uh, some hard questions. There's another. Yes. Dr. Cape, could you uh, turn back a couple of slides and say something I remember, say, give our bodies to God? Um, you said it's a new translation. Yourself. Well, let me tell you what I did for this. Um, on this, as I was preparing, uh, what I did is I took the English Standard Version, and I, I augmented it with some of my thoughts from, as I have translated Romans 12 myself, but I stuck with that generally speaking. Uh, but but the idea, I, I think, uh, I mean, do you have a question about the translation or about? Yes, I, okay. I had, um, I just confirmed. Um, when you translate, I mean, you have some freedoms, and I'm not familiar with this verse, but I say to present our bodies uh, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Yes. Um, if you have a, uh, some freedom, uh, just present our body, look like, seem like limited. How about present your, ourself, you know, body, soul, and spirit to God? Oh, good. Yeah, thanks. Um, Boy, that could get into a lot. Uh, the, what, what does it mean? The, the whole idea of bodied, embodiedness. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm convinced of is that Christianity is very much a world-affirming, body-affirming religion. That, uh, unfortunately, we've got this idea that we, that, that uh, again, I'm going back to some of my Baptist roots, is that salvation consists of telling people the gospel so we can get the heck out of Dodge. We're going to leave this world behind. We have hymns like that. We leave this world behind. We're going on to glory, right? And those aren't bad hymns, but I do think that the gospel is about the transformation of this world, the changing of this world. And, 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 and how do I live in this world? I live in this world with hands and feet and eyes and a body. Now, I can't parse exactly where the self is and where the spirit is and where the soul is. Every soul I've seen has been in a body somewhere. Now, I, I, I don't doubt, I, I, for those who say they've had transmigration of the soul, those kind of things, I, I, I don't know about that. But my experience of every soul, every self has been with a body. And this is where we live. We live these bodied existence. And the resurrection of Jesus says above, above all that the body is where God's redemption is taking place. What happened in the resurrection? Think about it. In the resurrection of Jesus, a piece of the earth. What are we made out of? The earth. The word Adam, Adam, comes from the Hebrew Adama, earth. God made the Adam from the Adama. In the resurrection, a piece of the earth became eternal. God was redeeming the earth in the resurrection of Jesus. And so the redemption of our bodies, this is what Paul says in, in, in Romans 8, that the creation itself is longing for this change that we all wait, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed and, and, and the daughters of God, I might add. But, but I, I do think that this notion of embodied existence is very important and that our lives in these bodies matter very much to God. And that uh, as, we, as we read, as we understand our, our, our bodied existence, that when we present these bodies to God, these bodies become his. Um, we are not free to do with our bodies what we wish anymore. All right? A woman is not free to do with her body what she wishes. A man is not free to do with his body once we have dedicated and given and presented that body to God. So um, I, I think... I want to take that language very seriously. When Paul says you unite yourselves with prostitutes, you're taking Christ into that relationship. Uh, I take that seriously from Paul's point of view. That's how he saw it. That these, this, this is where my existence is. This is where our existence is. This is where Christ is to be honored, where the kingdom is come. I don't know if that helps at all, but thanks. Other questions? Yes, we have one, one over here. Uh, nice. did, Paul's, did Paul's understanding of Jewish sacrifice lead him to the full understanding of the Eucharist? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, 
Paul's sacrificial language, uh, there's less in, of sacrificial language in Paul than in some of the other writers. Uh, I, I think Paul's understanding of the sacrifice would have been more in tune with what he knew was happening and what was going on in the temple sacrifices of his day. And that, and that what happens in the Eucharist is brand new, is an innovation. It is indebted to the Passover because the cup of wine, the bread, are those elements that come out of the Jewish Passover. But, uh, and, and I think that if any sacrifice at all might have informed that, it would have been the Passover sacrifice. But I do think that what happens with the Eucharist, in the Eucharist, is absolutely unique. Paul said, I received from the Lord. Remember that? Uh, this, uh, it was, how, how did he say? It was passed down to him through the tradition. But, but I would argue that what he means by that is, is that he received the tradition from the, the apostles, but his interpretation of it from the Lord himself. He received this from the Lord Jesus. His particular understanding that in the Eucharist, it, this is, in the Eucharist, a, a present opportunity to declare the gospel. And we do that, we keep doing that until he comes again. And that, I think that's absolutely brand new. You could not have had anything like that until you came to the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. So.